weeks where writers are an open book. I am host, uh, writer and editor Jane Van Voren Rogers, and I'm here today with Rob Fromberg, author of How to Walk with Steve, a memoir. And not only is Rob um, an author of this book, but he also is a, a dedicated, has been so far a dedicated uh, viewer of author talks. So Rob, I'm just so glad to have you here. Thank you so much just for taking the time. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks. And and you do such terrific interviews. There's so few places you can go in this uh, soundbite world where you can actually get a uh, see a substantive discussion. So thanks for having me. Well, you're so welcome. And I'm, I'm thrilled that you like the show. And I'm so glad um, to be able to talk with you about your book. So um, I'm going to just pop that up in the, the stream here. So mm -hmm. how to walk with Steve, a memoir. So tell us a little bit, what is what is this memoir about? Um, I should have a good ready answer for that. But the um <laughs> is not really the, the, well, the look well, I like, you want. I liked your, um, you know, when you say in the uh, the description of the book that it's a memoir about, you know, kind of your family's issues with art, alcoholism, autism, and death. It's like, yeah. wow, those are those are pretty heavy those, subjects. Those are so. big issues. So those are those are the issues in the book. Place is a very important part of the book as well. Originally this book was going to be called Peoria because I grew up in Peoria, Illinois, which is something that I spent many, many years feeling very uncomfortable saying in public. There's actually a scene in the book where I'm asked when I'm working on a, a a warehouse floor in New York City in the 1970s, you know, at the time probably 16 years old, and the guy says, uh, where are you from? The implication being, I don't look like anybody else there with my blonde hair and my horn rim glasses and my scrawniness. And, um, and I sort of thought, well, you know, do I lie? Do I tell them the truth? And I thought, all right, I'll just say Peoria. And uh, he started to laugh and the laughter spread to the people next to him, the people next to him, the people next to him, and soon the entire floor was laughing like crazy. And uh, and and then he said uh, he said it's okay, and uh, and then wanted to know if I wanted some angel dust. So that was <laughs> working in New York City in the 1970s when you're from Peoria. Uh, so place yeah. is very important in the book: Peoria, New York City, and uh, and some other places. So it, yes, the book is an attempt to capture the, the most um, potent moments of those experiences in my life. So the most potent moments related to uh, parents, related to art, alcoholism, autism, and, uh, and, and to do it in a way that really made you feel like or made me feel like I was reliving those experiences. Yeah, we have a we have a comment from one viewer, um, Juanita Mance, who was on the show a while ago um, for uh, her book Portrait of a of a Deputy Public Defender. Uh, she says that she loves the cover art. Um, <laughs> that that is quite interesting. Um, I I I don't know why I hadn't really noticed until today about how it brackets you know, your name and, and points to you and then and then the circle um, with your brother's name and points to him. So how how did that come about? <laughs> the uh, cover was designed by an enormously talented young man named Kevin Breen. And I'm sorry, yes, I am in the point in my life where I call people things like a young man. Um, <laughs> I and, feel that uh, way too. So thank you for validating that. <laughs> Kevin was also the developmental editor of the book, enormously talented guy. And, uh, you know, we said, what should be on the cover of the book? I said, well, yeah, you can send over some family photos if uh, if you want. And and he his reply seemed a little skeptical about that. But I've been in book publishing as well. And I can tell you that when authors say, oh, I have an idea for what the illustration on the cover of my book should be, you know, the only thing to do is to hide. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's almost never a good idea. So and we would never uh, show book covers to authors ahead of time. But anyway, I sent him a, uh, this photo in particular and a couple of others. And this actually includes uh, my mother, my brother, my grandmother, and the Washington Monument in the background. And he cropped all that out. So it just became uh, me trying to hang on to Steve as he's uh, trying to get away, which is his absolute standard pose in those years. He was always trying to get away. And somebody pointed out to me, I hadn't even noticed it, 
that I actually have a uh, a rabbit's foot hanging from my belt loop in this picture, I and and I, I remember that vaguely. I guess I felt like I needed a little, a little bit of luck, uh, but this is this is walking with Steve. In those days, was like this. Walking with Steve today is a little bit different. Uh, but I, yeah, I just I've gotten great comments on the cover, and I should give Kevin uh, credit also for the title of the book, because the title comes from the book, but that wasn't the uh, the title I had originally given it. So nothing like a good editor. Yeah, absolutely. And remind me, what's Kevin's last name again? Breen, B R E E N. B R E E N. Okay. And he is with uh, Leta Books, which is the name of the publisher. Delighted to find them as well. Yeah. Very nice. Well, and and like you said, I think a lot of times when people suggest using their own photos, it becomes more an issue of, you know, quality, resolution, mm -hmm. things like that. But but on memoirs, you do often see, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, especially, you know, some of these black and white photos and things like that. So I, I think that that's great that they were able to make this personal photo usable and and a strong image for the cover that actually works. There, that's uh, got to be kind of a rarity, right? It, it, it is. It, it, yeah, I'm glad it worked out. My father was a filmmaker uh, as well as a painter and a pretty darn decent photographer. So he took that picture. And then my uh, older brother, Paul, had fairly recently scanned a bunch of old family photos and he gave me a high res and low res version. So it was definitely a, a family effort. Well, let's let's back up a little bit. So, where did the idea for this memoir start? When when did you start feeling like you know this is just something that I need to write? I, I had uh, it written a lot, published a fair amount of fiction when I was uh, younger in my twenties and thirties. Um, didn't really write much in my forties and fifties for various reasons, uh, which we may end up talking about. Uh, but I was kind of drifting back into writing in my uh, late 50s. And, um, and, and I was, you know, I was writing a, things that felt like sketches. They were, they were sort of okay. They were sort of interesting, but I had the sense that I was avoiding something. Mm -hmm. And then in a, in a way on a separate track, I just, and I, I know we all have the sensation of just having the piles and puddles of, of stuff around our house that needs to be tidied up. And, and that's what it felt like to me. You just have these memories and scenes and moments that were almost all really uncomfortable, uh, just, just sort of hanging around. And, and I thought, you know, just, just as an exercise, let me try to write each one of them as as simply clearly and and concisely as i can and maybe that will be a way of kind of packaging them up tidying them up and and in a sense putting them in a container and and i just wondered how that would feel it was like spring cleaning essentially uh, and i didn't think of this necessarily as a book to begin with and i'd always a lot of my writing had been quasi autobiographical semi autobiographical mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, I always had that sense of, of you know, I was avoiding something. I was avoiding telling the truth, essentially. And so I thought, mm -hmm. just for me, let me give it a shot. Let's see what I can do. As embarrassing as it is, as, as uncomfortable as each of these episodes are, let me just try to witness them very, very carefully. And at a certain point, I, I felt like things were I proceeded pretty much chronologically. And you know, it started to hang together. It started to, to uh, you know, after 20, 30, 40, 50 pages of manuscript, you know, I thought, oh, I, I can kind of see a shape of this. So at that point I thought, well, maybe maybe this is a book, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's uh, uh, but it really started as just a, an internal exercise. There's, there's so much to unpack in what you just said. I, I know that I uh, I definitely relate as a writer to having the piles and the various folders and notebooks and scraps of paper. And so when you said that, that was just really validating for me <laughs> about the piles and the papers and the, because sometimes I felt so badly about like, oh my gosh, I need to get this all together. I need to, you know, type it in or get it scanned so that all these things aren't just sitting around in my basement getting <laughs> lost or because, you know, then you can sometimes find those real gems, you know, when you start to look through that stuff and go, hey, this is something I can, you know, build something around. 
And the other thing that stands out to me is when you say that you were writing fiction and then that as you were starting to, you know, as you were doing that, you were starting to kind of write these, you know, kind of vignettes and sketches about about your own life and that that kind of started to bleed through in your writing. And I know that was definitely a theme that came up last week when I spoke with uh, Ronit Plank about when mm -hmm. she comes back. And that was something that she mentioned as well. So can you talk about that a little, just about when, when you start to feel the autobiography bleeding through <laughs> into the fiction? Sure. Um, I, I think most of what I wrote as a younger person, um, was, was very autobiographical. And I think that's very typical. You start writing, you're a teenager, you, you, your own experiences seem to be the, the most important experience of all, and no one else has ever had this experience. <laughs> and so that's just what you tend to do. Sure. Um, I, I went to uh, Warren Wilson College, the MFA program for writers there, and, and I was a fiction writer in that program. And one of the, the real pressures I felt, uh, one of the ways that the, the expectations of the world presented themselves to me, including at Warren Wilson, was, um, well, if you're going to write fiction, then here's what fiction looks like. Uh, you know, it looks like this, and and you have, you have main characters, and they develop, and there's conflict, and there's plot, plot. Oh my God, is there plot? Big capital P. And um, you know, I just I don't feel like I was ever that kind of a fiction writer. I think I was more. I would have been more comfortable as a poet, frankly. Uh, but I just I, I'm sort of limited in that way. Uh, I didn't feel like like um, I had that that uh, uh, way with language. Um, and eventually I just thought, well, there's this very narrow range of what I can do. And so I will just stick in that very narrow range. And it was not terribly plot oriented, fairly autobiographical um, fiction. And I kind of got away with that for a while, got along okay. Um, and, uh, but then at a certain point, I just stopped writing. And, uh, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that. The, the easy reason we all cite is kids. Oh, you know, you got a couple of kids that takes all your time. And oh, I'm working a job. And you know, those are those are, you know, but the, the, there's a lot of validity in those uh, explanations. But it was something more than that. And I think ultimately it was this. It was if I was in fact going to write about myself, about my own views, then I needed to be much more honest about those views. And so when I started to get back into writing, um, and this was my, my mid fifties, um, I wrote short pieces and, and, uh, but they, they felt very slight to me. They felt like I was still sort of missing the point. So ultimately I just wanted to challenge myself and say, all right, if this is what you do, then you need to look more closely. You need to see more directly. And in particular, you need to be more honest. And, and so one of the goals I set for myself is I am going to embarrass myself. Every page I want to embarrass myself. When I'm not embarrassing myself, I don't think I'm doing what I should be doing here. I don't feel uncomfortable if I don't feel embarrassed. So that <laughs> was kind of the process of saying, all right, you're going to write about yourself, write about yourself. Now, interesting thing is, since writing this book, I've continued to write a lot. And now I am not writing uh, much fiction. I am more writing nonfiction, but it's 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 much, much less self-focused. And, you know, if we have time, we can talk about that. But it's just been a yeah. really weird journey of, of not figuring out what I'm expected to do as a writer, but figuring out what I can do as a writer. But even more to the point, if I could just, I mean, it sounds silly, but sort of be a better person, just be, be a more- Gosh, that's not silly at all. <laughs> honest person, and yeah. I can use writing to do that. Um, so that, that's, a, that's been, been the, uh, the journey. I, I relate to that. I've I've written some short fiction, but I can also recognize that that was also heavily influenced by, you know, like you said, autobiographical fiction, heavily influenced by, you know, my own life and, and its mm -hmm. events. And and then I also have written poetry. And I, I think that there's something about poetry because, you know, it's more, I, I think it's um, more of a, a pure art form in a way. And again, it's almost like tapping into that 
artistic side of your brain versus the analytical side that it's more like the emotion flows out and it's more about it's about the sounds and it's about the feelings and and all those things and so so there's times that in writing poetry i felt as though i'm i'm being more honest in a way than when i'm writing short fiction in which you're changing all the details and kind of cloaking it in anonymity and acting like it's not really about your life right right I mean, it just, and, and that seems like a lot of work too to me and <laughs> and and you know essentially it seems like the the idea there is to is, you know it feels like covering up in a sense and uh you know, I just I didn't really want to uh, I didn't really want to do that anymore. Um, and and, uh, you know, in the old days, uh, you used to talk about in literature classes, imagination versus invention. And uh, and, and that's one of the things that, um, you know, I've tried to look at more closely and be a little more a little harder on myself. If it's invention, I should be able to sense that and I should be able to not do it imagination that should be what I what I pursue uh, and the person who really inspired me the most in that is uh, my brother Steve because as a person with autism he was uh, enormously creative in the sense that he did a lot of drawing um, a lot of close observing of things that didn't have uh, the kind of inherent value uh, or, or sort of public value, um, mm. but were very, very important to him, which strikes me as being an artistic impulse for sure. And the importance to him didn't have anything to do with their utilitarian qualities, but had to do with something wordless that spoke to, to him. And so he really has been uh, and continued to be, and maybe even more than ever, has been my mentor in uh, how to view things as um, as an artist, as mm -hmm. and and to leave aside the uh, demands of of you know sort of the societal aesthetic demands of any particular art form. That's a really beautiful sentiment, and I I think that is often you know what I've heard sometimes about being able to learn uh, more from people with special needs and that it often is a different appreciation of things and a beauty of living in the moment and embracing you know the simple joys of life which again sometimes you know when we get stressed all those things kind of get pushed out of the way and we forget to notice those details so i think that's a really a really lovely sentiment that you shared and i'll give you an example so when steve was I don't know, uh, maybe seven, eight years old. And at this point he would just be starting to speak. So he was nonverbal until he was about eight. Mm. Uh, but you know, eight through about 15, he was a, uh, he drew like a fiend. And mm. one of his favorite subjects were school buses. So he would stand outside and watch all the school buses go by in the afternoon. And he would go home and he would draw these, they were side views, uh, two-dimensional, almost like diagrams of the school buses, but his attention to detail was exquisite. I and mean, he didn't draw, he had a bit of a shaky hand when it came to lines and lettering. Uh, you know, somebody like somebody almost uh, you know, uh, younger than he was. Um, but boy, oh boy, he got the shape of the windows, the number of windows, the shape of the hood. The, the lettering on the side, and there'd be little tiny decals that would say the manufacturer of the bus line, for example, and he would get that and he would cut them out and he kept them in a, uh, a plastic uh, box. And so he had at one point, probably a hundred or more of these different school buses. And so, you know, you just, you ask yourself, well, you know, what, what do you take away from that? But, you know, and, and I think that, for him, he what he adored was the regularity, but the subtle differences. So he loves McDonald's, for example, because every McDonald's is the same, but every McDonald's is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And um, he loves uh, uh, maps for similar kinds of reasons. Uh, and um, and and so 
So what was the value of that? Well, the value of that is that it satisfied something, I am assuming, I mean, it, it's, it's highly presumptuous, I, I have to admit, to say that, you know, I know what he's feeling, but the best mm -hmm. inference I can make is that there's a level of comfort in that. Uh, and, and in that comfort is, you know, what maybe I would call beauty. I think also there's a, a need there. So he needed to capture that regularity and have it with him in black and white in a box in his house. And that too is something that I think is a, an artistic impulse. Uh, and, and I think the most important thing I've learned from that is, you know, why school buses? Why not school buses? So we <laughs> all have weird things that interest us just you know, weird questions that we have as we go through the day. So yesterday, my question was, why is it that in these chairs that you and I are sitting on, the, the uh, different levers that we push and pull to make it go up and down or back or forth are different on every single chair. And so every time you go sit somewhere, you have to uh, find different levers and experiment with them. And why can't that be systematized? So right. and normally that would be something that I wouldn't actually say out loud. It would be something that would just sort of <laughs> flip through my head and I would censor it and say, nobody actually wants to hear that on a, <laughs> uh, a, a one hour show about authors talking uh, or about authors writing. And, um, uh, but for Steve, that kind of thing is, is paramount to him. It's central in his mind. It's total, gets total focus from him. And so if we all have little blips and bits of things that interest us, whether they be shapes or colors or phenomena, the, the, what I can learn from Steve is to seize those and to look at them very, very closely and to give the experience of them their due. So that's been, uh, from a, a writing standpoint, what I've learned from him. And, and I must say, then the conversation about writing becomes much, much different. You're not talking about am I writing poetry? You're not talking about am I writing fiction? You're really the thought process is more about the experience of moments and sensations, much like you describe uh, the, uh, uh, the the process of, of writing poetry. Mm. That's really interesting, and I I know that I think you do a really nice job in the book too of capturing you know some of those details that you know, when you moved to Peoria that, you know, the street signs were, you know, green and white as opposed to black and white and that, and that Steve was commenting on that and, yeah. or that, um, he, you know, he can walk in a building and then be able to draw these amazing like blueprint drawings mm -hmm. of whatever building he was just in. And it's like, that is phenomenal. He could that do that. So Steve could go into a, bu uh, a, a building one time, come out, draw a blueprint of that building. And, and the, again, so, so attending to that even more closely, uh, one of the things that always interested him was kitchen sinks. Like how many tubs were in the kitchen sink? Was it two or was it one? The shape of the toilet was very important to him. Which way the doors would swing was very important to him. And to this day, if I say, uh, Steve, you know, we just uh, visited my son Daniel's new apartment and he'll say, how many uh, tubs are in the kitchen sink? And he'll ask about how does the toilet have a tank or is it hooked directly into the wall? You know, these are still very, very important things to him. And, you know, why not? I think I think that's lovely. Whatever. I mean, isn't that what writing should be? It's like whatever presents itself to you is important, is important. And, and if there's one place you can go to fend off the, the, the dicta of society, it, it should be when you're writing. Now, the irony, and it's a cruel irony for Steve, is that, um, you know, I don't want to paint too beautiful a picture of this because this is also uh, the root of, of you know, a, a really, really anxiety-filled existence when you don't know what the world expects of you and you're constantly trying to um, navigate your sort of hazy understanding of those expe expectations while still being true to what motivates you. Again, I'm drawing some inferences, but you know, I've been with him for so long. I, you know, I know what anxiety looks like in him, and and he's a 
and, and it's a very, very difficult way to be. But is that not what writers go through as well? Uh, you know, we're, we, we don't necessarily just slide perfectly into roles in society. And, uh, and, and so you know, uh, knowing Steve, being with Steve is today just really the, almost the only thing I think about when it comes to uh, uh, the creative process. How interesting. And I, I'm glad that you started to allude to the difficulties a bit because I think it's important, you know, just that we talk about that some too. And even even just in that cover image, again, just seeing you can see the the tension and you can see the that you're, you know, you're trying to keep him with you. And and so can you talk about, you know, kind of some of the challenges of, of growing up with an autistic sibling and, and how, you know, how you try to manage that? Sure. Well, as you can see here, and as I mentioned, Steve was always trying to get away. And, um, you know, sometimes I think about that just to digress momentarily. I mean, you know, how many of us uh, walk into a party or the first day on a new job, or maybe the 230th day of your job <laughs> in the morning, and you're seized with one desire and one desire only, turn around and leave. <laughs> and so I wonder if that isn't part of his uh, his hyperactivity, but he was, he was just a very, very hyperactive kid. He ran. I never saw him walk until he turned, boy, maybe 16. He ran everywhere he went, or he would sit and do things like listen to the same 15 second part of the Beatles day in the life uh, mm. over and over and over again, lifting the arm of the turntable and putting it back down. Uh, and so going out in public was, was you know, awkward. Uh, you know, if you went to the movies, he may or may not sit there. Um, and probably more likely than not, he would not sit there. He would go running off in the, the middle of the movie. Uh, you know, going to any public place was uh, difficult. And so one of the things you really have to kind of realize or, or, or get acclimated to is this idea of, of, are you embarrassed by this or are you not embarrassed by this? And my parents were great. I think they, they um, were, were very comfortable uh, or as comfortable as you can be with, this is who he is, this is how he behaves. And if the, you know, our neighbors in Peoria don't understand it, then they don't understand it. Uh, but they're more mature and older than I was. So it was a little bit different when I was, so I was uh, two and a half years roughly older than Steve. So it took a little more understanding when a a kid in the neighborhood would come up and say, your brother just did this weird thing. And, and you know, you'd be a little embarrassed, but, but then pretty soon it becomes more a matter of uh, wanting to defend him and wanting to be mm -hmm. the, uh, the big brother and the protector. And that's a, an interesting dynamic too in a, a household where somebody has special needs. Um, I mean, of course the attention is spent on that person. Uh, mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, I have an older brother, uh, myself, uh, my parents, of course they were focused on Steve. And um, you know that wasn't particularly a problem for me. I always felt like I got uh, plenty of attention, uh, but it was more, you, know, you kind of saw the wear of it, uh, the wear of, of constantly. I mean, if you think about how tough it is just to, to have a toddler running around or a puppy, we mm -hmm. have a, a, a puppy or he's just past the puppy stage, which means he's now gone from being cute to being a total terror. <laughs> and uh, and, and I, 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 I'm stunned that he hasn't come in here and leapt on the laptop during this conversation. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, to have that all day long is rough when you have a toddler, but to have it with no, I mean, my parents didn't know it was ever going to end. And in fact, you know, they died before it ended, uh, before the hyperactivity ended. So that's something that wears on a household. And then that can cause a weight that everyone in the household feels. And a lot of what I'm recording here is, uh, is um, uh, how the, the, a child sees that kind of uh, intense pressure and discomfort and depression 
in the household. And there were some special circumstances. Uh, you know, my, uh, my mother had a, a drinking problem, a sleeping pill problem that I think had a lot to do with dealing with Steve, but also her own upbringing. Uh, mm-hmm. My parents were both artists. My mother was a absolutely incredible painter. Uh, just, just, mm-hmm. But I think she felt like with Steve as her son and being trapped in Peoria, Illinois, of all places, because that's where my dad was teaching, that you know, what was going to come of her enormous talent as a painter. Um, my father was a, a little more relaxed about things, uh, uh, but you know he too, um, I think, couldn't avoid the the stress of having this uh, this son who required so 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 much attention, and so a lot of what I'm witnessing is is what it's like to see that on a day to day basis. Well, and and uh, I know you talk about the willingness to be uncomfortable and mm-hmm. and not be afraid of embarrassing yourself on on every page and not only is that a really brave and open thing to do as a as a writer and a person but it it also um I'm sorry I just lost my train of thought um it also i think speaks to you know when you're you're when I was reading the book, I just, I felt like I could feel that tension. And when you, when you were talking about, you know, writing these, these vignettes that you'd started to capture, I, I just was feeling all of this gut level tension reading your book. And so I think that's just such a tremendous thing when you can make readers feel the way that you felt in that situation. And so I think that's a really tremendous thing that you've done with this book. I I appreciate that the the editor and and one of the uh, people who wrote a blurb for the book, uh, they keep, and the the publisher as well, they keep saying now, now a lot of this is really funny too. You know, you can't forget that a lot of this is funny. In fact, one of the blurbs uh, is from an author named Valerie Block who wrote a number of, of fabulous, novels. Uh, one of my favorites is, was it something I said? And, uh, and it, it, she wrote a long uh, uh, series of comments about the book, all of which focused on the, the humor of it. Somebody being trapped in a situation they have no way of, of understanding and, uh, and just feeling a little lost and, and the kind of the absurdity of the situation, the absurdity of the jobs that I worked. Um, and, uh, so, uh, you know, one of my favorite authors is a, a woman named Hallie Butler and her first book, uh, Jillian was called by the Chicago Tribune, the feel bad book of the year. And, uh, and, and so I sort of, and I thought I took that as a, a fantastic compliment. And so there's definitely some feel bad parts of this, but the feel bad parts are short. And then they stop and then maybe there's another one and it stops. But they're also, I think, you know, looked at from the distance of time, they're, they're, uh, uh, I think they're pretty funny. But the distance of time is something I, I hope you don't mind if I talk about this for a minute. Yeah. We've been talking yeah. about the book uh, and the, the scenes in the book. And, um, you know, as I said, when I started this, I really wasn't thinking book, book. I was just thinking, let me just write out these scenes and see what they look like. Um, and, um, you know, the memoirs I read, the memoirs I respect, uh, usually as, from a point of view standpoint, are, are written from a distance. So there's the more informed adult viewpoint and knowledge base and experience base that reflects on past events. And then in some points when you've got a scene, you're within that scene, you're very much experiencing the, the tension of that scene. But then at other times, um, you know, you can say, well, you know, mother grew up in this uh, uh, environment and the history of that place was this. And, and all of that is, is rich and, uh, and, and wonderful and edifying. Uh, and I just chose not to do any of that. Um, I mean, not, none of it. I, I thought, um, you know, and not because I view any of those things as being bad things. Uh, but my in- that just wasn't what I was interested in. I was just interested in capturing moments at, at the time. So there's a very little distance in the book throughout. It starts when I'm uh, 
my earliest memories, there's a gap in the book uh, uh, where I stop recording things when I'm about, um, I don't know, 25 or so. And then it picks back up uh, in the uh, maybe two or three years ago. Um, and and they really, the, the, every instant in the book is meant to be in the moment. And so if in the moment there's some assessment of the situation, some reflection back, then that would be there. Um, but there's no authorial voice that I'm at least, well, there, there can never not be an authorial voice, but I, I certainly don't try to create it. So it's almost like court testimony. This is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened. And then you don't want the witness to explain what uh, anything means or give it any kinds of uh, excuses or, or reasoning. Just tell me the facts, what happened. So it's sort of the ultimate Jack Webb drag that book. Uh, now, <laughs> now, I don't know. I don't know how many people anymore really even get that reference. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that's really interesting, though, of almost like a, a court reporting style. And yeah. and one thing that I noticed um, and, you know, I mentioned to you earlier was just that um, off uh, not on the interview yet, but uh, that the first part of the book is written in present tense, mm -hmm. which is often hard to pull off with, you know, all of these events that are past tense. But I think you writing in present tense, it really took me into those childhood moments with you. And, and I think to the kind of person that you are, you know, being, you know, and an sort of advanced intellectual person, it's like you made that so relatable that I think it's almost like it blended that child and adult, you know, together more where I felt like, you know, it's like I could feel, you know, what you were feeling back then and, and understanding it. But, but like you said, without you having to come in, I think as an adult narrator and say, and this is how I felt about that. Yeah. Yeah. It was more, you just let those events speak for themselves of, you know, my mother said this to me, you know, I, here's what I'm seeing. This is what's happening. And, and you do the, like, I, I, I'm just blown away by that. I think right. it's really amazing how, how you do that because it's, again, it's, it's, it's hard to even describe, but it's like, it's so effective. It's so effective in helping the reader feel those emotions and, and relating to it as both a child and an adult at the same time. And both thinking of you in the past, but walking through those moments with you reading the book in the present. But I appreciate that. I, you know, these are also um, you know, defects and limitations as a writer. I remember one uh, teacher at uh, in graduate school saying, uh, "It's just astonishing when you write anything because you 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 refuse to say so much in what you're writing." I think I have a terror of writing something that a reader is going to look at and say, "Oh yeah, I figured, I knew that." I got that idea. And I think somebody along the way said, you should always show and never tell. And and being a good, you know, I'm a rule follower. And uh, <laughs> you know, so I heard that and said, all right, no more telling ever. All I'm going to do is show. And if there's any telling, it's going to be telling through showing. And uh, I probably take that a little too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's such common advice, you know, for writers too. It, that's just classic writing yeah. advice is show, don't tell. You know, do do something with that character that shows me how they're feeling. Don't tell me that they're feeling sad. You know, show them crying. Show them, you know, throwing a glass against the wall. Show, you know, whatever it is, you know, show me how how that feels. But um I, we've we've got. I'm just going to mention we've got about 12 people watching live uh, today, right. which is really great. So, um, if anyone watching has any questions that they would like to ask Rob, feel free to uh, write in, and and we'll make sure to get those asked um, questions about writing or you know uh, growing up with an autistic brother, um, art, uh, whatever it is that we'd like to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, I also wondered, Rob, would you mind reading that first uh, page of your book that gives kind of the synopsis of of your experience? I will. So this is the only hard copy I have of the book. It's an advanced 
advanced copies. Yeah, the book comes uh, out on September 7th. I'll just mention that and it's available for pre-order on Amazon. And if you're watching on YouTube, it, the link is there. And we also, I think, shared the link on Facebook. But. Great. All right, here we go. This is just the, this is the first page of the book. About 25 years ago, a college student of mine asked to interview me for a project she was doing for another class. I liked this student. She was a terrific writer and had a sharp tongue. I wanted to impress her. We met in a coffee shop. She said, okay, tell me your life story. For me, a perfect question. I told her I was born in Peoria, Illinois, that my mother and father were both artists, that my mother was an alcoholic and a sleeping pill addict, and that I had an autistic brother. I took care of a lot when we were growing up. I told her that I started college at age 15, that at age 16, I moved to New York City by myself, that my dad, only 52, died a couple of years later, and that I returned home. I told her that my mom died soon after, that I became my autistic brother's guardian, that I got married, that the three of us moved to North Carolina to get my brother proper care, that I started teaching college at age 23, that my wife divorced me soon after, and that I moved to Chicago and still take care of my brother. Finished with my answer, I settled back to await her praise. She looked up from her notebook and said, that's it? <laughs> and the book actually as a response to that. I thought, you know, that, that seemed to me to be an entirely reasonable reaction she has. Like, that's it? That, you're not telling me anything there. You're just giving me a bunch of, you know, a bunch of, of uh, uh, you know, not even facts, just, just sort of a list of, it's like a, your resume. Uh, tell me something more. And at the time, I thought, well, what do you want me to say? And then I thought, all right, actually, I, I, I think I'm going to take about 250 pages and I'm going to answer her question. Like, is that it? Well, OK, no, actually, it wasn't it. I will now tell you what it is. Mm. I think that hearing all of those things, though, I think that's what makes it funny is just that those are such even just saying the facts, they're such deep and profound and kind of surprising experiences, you know, to share. And, and you know, as you said, we, we all certainly have our challenges in, in life and, and family difficulties and things like that. But, but it's still almost just like, well, <laughs> like, you know, you wouldn't just, oh, oh gosh, or oh, that happened, or oh, I'm sorry, or, you know, <laughs> whatever. But just the, the that, like, yeah. she wasn't, she, that was not her reaction. She was yeah, just, I, just, like, I love that. It? Really? Okay. Yeah. Like, well, I thought that was great. All right. I remembered that. I took it as a challenge for sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the other things in the, uh, in the book we haven't talked about is the, that I just noticed as I was reading that is the uh, time in New York City. So when I was, when I lived in New York, uh, it was uh, roughly 1975 through 1977. Mm -hmm. And that was for any, any music fans watching, uh, that was the, the dawn of the punk rock movement in New York City. And uh, I lived on the Lower East Side. I lived just a few blocks from CBGB. And uh, you know, they didn't believe in carting people in those days. So if you were 15, 16, oh, wow. 17 years old, you could go to Max's Kansas City and CBGB. And so there's a section of the book that's about my experience uh, as a basically a you know, scrawny kid trying to live in the, the big city. And believe me, New York was a, a, a much less friendly place at that time than oh, it is these days. Um, uh, but that was fun too. But even there, I, I, you know, I sort of had this choice. I could talk about the Ramones and I can talk about the New York Dolls and I can talk about television and talk about Patti Smith and describe them. And I just, like, uh, I just felt exhausted even, even just thinking about how to be the 1,921st person to try to explain how cool Tom Berlain of television was when he was performing at CBGB while the mm -hmm. stage was still just this high off the ground. And so, you know, again, I just tried to focus on what, what the unusual, uh, more personal moments uh, were like and what the sensations were like. It, it, it was quite a thing to sit down and each moment try to remember what was the light like? Um, what was the, what, what did my body feel like? Mm. What were things like tac tactily? Mm. Uh, exactly what words did I hear people say? What did things smell like? What did things sound like? Uh, it, it, it was uh, qu 
quite a, a pretty wonderful experience to to uh, to do that and try to recreate those sensations. So, so what was that transition like going from <laughs> Peoria to New York? That had to be pretty intense. <laughs> well, New York was a big part of my family's life. Um, my father grew up in Brooklyn, and he had a real. He was born in 1925, so he had an honest to goodness uh, play stickball in the street Brooklyn boyhood, and uh, and we would go back to. Brooklyn and New York to visit his family and the city every year. And for my brother, Steve, those car trips were the most important thing in his life. You can mm. still say to Steve, Steve, what route did we take to New York in 1973? And he will say, he will say April, 1973. And he will give you the entire route from Peoria to New York, wow. uh, including knowledge of where there might've been some construction and a detour. Um, and, Amazing. Uh, and he has every <laughs> Rand McNally yearly road atlas from 1973 to today in his room uh, with a lot of other things he collects. Um, and so uh, so looking at it through Steve's eyes, you mentioned the street signs earlier. This was just this was so important to him is seeing the signs of being in a different place. So Peoria to me seemed drab. I mean, just drab. And, and so would, Peoria would you was write... a manufacturing town. Oh, well, we we, uh, we we share a geography. Well, what I was going to say was, would you mind reading that brief passage about Peoria? Because I think it's really interesting. It's on page 99. Oh, I remember thank you, that. because I was going to say, no out, way I'm going to find that. It stuck out to me. And I was just like, oh, gosh, this is really interesting. So I, so for anyone who doesn't know, I'm from the Quad Cities area, which is about an hour and a half from Peoria. And, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, so we list everything by how far away things are by time, not by distance. <laughs> so, right. but we just recently, we like, we were, <laughs> when we were setting up this interview, we were, you know, kind of checking on times with like Pacific and Central. And I thought, well, he, he must be, you know, he must be on the West Coast. And I was like, wait, he's in Wisconsin? We're both in Central? What was that? <laughs> so we just had this funny moment earlier of going, wait a second, hold on, we're both in the Midwest and we didn't even need to be doing this translation. So, but um, I thought your your description of Peoria was really interesting and 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 fun and we'll talk about that, but I'd just like to hear you read that if you're- Sure. Willing. <laughs> so this was my, at the time, sense of what it, what I felt like being from Peoria. Peoria, Wade, Peoria was the, the title of the book until uh, very late in the game. Um, and, and Peoria felt like an albatross to me for sure. Now I feel very, very different about it now. And mm -hmm. I appreciate and enjoy Peoria and actually like to visit Peoria, but, uh, you know, compared to New York, it, it felt pretty stifling. So this was, uh, this is when, uh, the, the guy on the, there are numerous, uh, Peoria, New York sort of scenes here, but this is when the guy in the warehouse floor asked me where I was from and I was contemplating how I would answer that question. Um, and I said, yet answering this question was complicated. Peoria, the name sounded like a wine. The city had long been the butt of jokes or at best a symbol of all that is unremarkable. It was true. Everything in Peoria was flat. Everything was gray. Everything was medium sized. Everything was sad. I felt so sorry for my father, although he seemed to have adjusted. Sorry that he had grown up in storybook Brooklyn and ended up in Peoria. I imagined him meeting fellow artists on visits to New York and having to answer the question, where do you live? And facing up bravely to having to answer Peoria. I knew that to my mother, Peoria was a daily horror of classlessness and mediocrity, an indictment of all her values of aesthetics and behavior. Peoria was the city that gave her Steve, and Steve's dead brother. Steve had a, uh, a twin who died. Um, I believed that it was not possible for anyone, no matter how talented, how confident, how worldly, how famous, to lose the stain of Peoria. Peoria would always be there, needing attention every day in order to be tamped down and hidden, eating away at whatever confidence anyone would be able to present to the world. That twitch of doubt in a charismatic person's smile that would be Peoria. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that 
It's so well, funny you know, because, it, is, because would, it does show your perspective. And well, it's, at the and time, yeah. I mean, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's a, I have to pitch a fabulous book by uh, one of the authors. I forget the other author's name at the moment is Jonathan Wright. And the book is called Punks from Peoria. Mm. And, uh, and, and I didn't know there were any punks in Peoria. And this all took place after I moved away from Peoria. But it's it published by University of Illinois Press. And it's a, a, it's a semi-scholarly work. But it really talks about uh, what people did to, to sort of create an environment they could live in in Peoria or to use the drabness of Peoria for music's sake. And I must say, Jane, that a lot of the people uh, because there was never a place to perform in Peoria. There was no place to play except a, a, a VFW hall. Uh, no, sure. <laughs> they would go to the Quad Cities and play and try to get some of the great punk bands from the Quad Cities to come and play the VFW halls in Peoria. So anyway, that was oh, that was Peoria at the time. And, uh, right. and for my brother, Steve, uh, he loved Peoria. He loved everything about Peoria. Moving with him to North Carolina was so painful for him. Mm. And eventually he got to be an expert in all the roads and all the highways and all the signs and all the nuances of, uh, of, um, of uh, North Carolina. But he loved Peoria, but he also loved the contrast with New York. So he's the one who was focused on what is the, how different is the color of a blacktop? In Brooklyn, how different mm -hmm. is the color of the street signs in Brooklyn? And to be honest, those are the things I loved about it too. And so that was a real bond between the two of us. Is you know, that that those differences were were super charged and super exciting. And for me, that meant I moved there. Wow. Well, and and the when you also talk about Peoria as how and, and like you said, you write about it several times in the book. But when you mention about how like everything is medium sized and everything is flat and almost like and and when your mother makes the comment about um, you know a certain sculpture that it would succeed if either it was really small or huge, mm -hmm. but not in, you know, not medium. And then you're saying, you know, everything there is medium. Yeah. And the, so. the, the thing is that if you want to live long, you need to be medium sized. You know, that's like we're a medium sized planet. Medium sized people live longer. Medium is pretty good, actually. So <laughs> I've come to a sort of a different way of thinking about things yeah. later in life. Well, and I, I know when you write about Peoria too, you also mention about your your classmates and and your when your teachers asking like how many people work at you know uh, cat caterpillar and how many people work you know at you know some of the other common large Hiram Walker Pat's yeah. Blue Ribbon yeah right th those places and then when you say you know my father works at Bradley University you really get the sense that there was kind of a feeling of like, okay, so I'm not part of this sort of blue collar manufacturing world. Like I'm a little different. And so did you definitely feel that way growing up? That was a, a huge part of growing up. Um, fortunately, I had a, a handful of friends as I got a little bit older uh, who, thanks to Facebook, social media, and the internet, I can still interact with and have a great time interacting with. Uh, one friend in particular uh, named Dina, now Dina Tarlin, uh, her older brother Rodney knew all the hip stuff. I mean, he knew the coolest, most obscure music, and he mm. was like our pipeline to cool things. So Dina and I, we were Andy Warhol, David Bowie, uh, um, uh, Clockwork Orange, uh, you know, we the, we were we were in with the the cool stuff of the the early seventies. But by and large, it was really it was really rough. Um, I didn't want to invite people over to our house. This is a little bit earlier in uh, uh, childhood because it was filled with this weird kinetic art and abstract art and weird paintings and and you know I was just the questions I got asked seemed seemed. I seem to just confuse people. And, and I think in, probably in some way, every single person in childhood feels like they're all alone. So I don't say that I had a different experience from anyone else, but that was the nature of my experiences. I didn't belong here. My mother felt like she didn't belong there. My dad was 
you know, on paper didn't belong there, but seemed pretty comfortable, uh, even though he missed the New York Yankees and, uh, and, and the, uh, well, the Brooklyn Dodgers at the time. But uh, yeah. uh, so the, the baseball and the, the arts weren't quite as built up. But so my dad took it as an opportunity. And this, I think, is just, just is part of a lesson that I hope kind of it shows that I learned through the book is you know, he was in a place where we did not have uh, a strong uh, arts community. Um, but there was an arts community and he found it. And uh, and he would bring Merce Cunningham, uh, Stan Vanderbeek, um, uh, um, uh, come on, the geodesic dome guy, uh, Buckminster Fuller, uh, Len Lai, so experimental artists, uh, experimental filmmakers, uh, Buckminster Fuller, one of the great geniuses of our time, Merce Cunningham, John Cage, and they would come, he would get them to visit Peoria on their way from Chicago to St. Louis when they were uh, touring. Oh, and so nice. these were people who uh, we had in our house. Oh, so, you know, picture me as a, you know, whatever, an eight-year-old playing chess with John Cage. It was, I mean, it was, wow. so So that really is, and that's kind of how the book resolves. That's the final scene of the book is, is so you're different. But on the other hand, um, I had John Cage in our house and I played chess with him. So, you know, that, that wasn't so bad actually to be different. And, and my brother, Steve, different, but he too has really found his way in the world. Well, COVID has thrown him for a loop, like, like very few loops a person can be thrown for, but he's yeah. found a, a, a way in the world too, where uh, he can be true to the things that give him pleasure, have enough structure that, um, uh, he gets along very well. And, uh, you know, and this is, this is, uh, you know, kind of what we all do is we take the, the sharp edges of our childhood and, uh, we don't necessarily s smooth them off completely. We still appreciate the, the sharpness of them, uh, but we can appreciate them in a little bit different way. Well, and I, I also think too, I, I hope that some of those perceptions maybe of, of uh, Midwestern, you know, metropolitan areas or rural areas or whatever, um, that that those maybe have shifted a little bit. I, I can relate, you know, to a lot of people, um, you know, feeling, you know, like when I was in growing up and in high school and things, people thought similar things, I think, about the Quad Cities of like, there's nothing here and there's nothing to do and there's no... And I know that you mentioned that at one point about, um, you know, your mother, you know, in the passage that you read about your mother feeling that way of almost like this is the most like anti-intellectual, anti-artistic area. And so do you feel that some of those perceptions of, of kind of Midwestern areas have kind of changed or do you think that there's still maybe some mm -hmm. some misunderstanding around that? I. I, I wish I knew, I think with our, our current sort of polarized, uh, bifurcated society as uh, you know, haves and have nots continue to diverge, um, it's really hard to say how those perceptions uh, are registered these days. I do go regularly to Peoria and I, I, I live in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a you know, very you know, some somewhere between a college town and an old hippie town, uh, but certainly very liberal. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do make a point of spending as much time as possible in uh, smaller uh, towns in the Midwest and always have enjoyed that experience and enjoy it a lot more as I stop trying to do anything other than look at it and say, what am I seeing? Mm -hmm. And by and large, what I'm seeing is, is you know, things are pretty good. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Well, can you talk a little bit about, I know you said that you have the MFA from Warren yeah. Wilson, and can you talk a little bit about how that experience has, you know, shaped you as a writer and shaped you writing this book? Um, boy, I always get in trouble when I talk about <laughs> MFA programs. I mean, Warren Wilson is fantastic. I was the first, uh, class at Warren Wilson is, is a well-known MFA program, but mm -hmm. I was there 
uh, I wasn't the first graduating class, but I was the first class that had my entire tenure there because the program had moved from another university. Mm. Uh, so you know, this was a very, very early days, but I got to meet some absolutely incredible writers. Um, the, the Barbara Greenberg was one of my uh, teachers at Warren Wilson. This book wouldn't exist without her because she mm. saw some work that I had done in some ways very similar to this. But, you know, again, this was 1981. Um, and and told me how to focus a little more, to add a little more detail, uh, gave me a lot of good suggestions. And so, in a way, this book is uh, is is you know Barbara's take on my super minimalist writing, and mm -hmm. saying you know how how can you keep the spirit of that but still enrich it some. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ha having said that, um, I didn't give school, I didn't give any school a fair shake. All I wanted to do was to get someplace. And and so I wanted to teach writing. I didn't, you know, I didn't really have any other skills uh, other than, than writing. I wasn't even a mm. super good English scholar. So I just, you know, I got through high, I didn't even graduate from high school. I got through college as fast as I could. I got through graduate school as fast as I could. I just wanted to go somewhere else. And in hindsight, mm. that wasn't really the best approach to it um, and uh, but certainly those those lessons uh, stay with you well it, it sounded though too that you know you were able to advance you know quickly and at a young age yeah. through school too and so are you saying that that wasn't necessarily a good thing no it was not a not necessarily a good thing at all um and it, it, <laughs> You know, it was, I, I'm laughing because I'm remembering uh, an administrator I talked to at Brooklyn College where I was considering going when I was uh, probably talking with this woman when I was 15 years old, who was so annoyed with me because I just said, so if you get this many credits in this area, this many credits in this area, this many credits in this area, then you graduate. And she said, well, I like to think you learn something too. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, I no, I, I, uh, it was, it was not a good thing. I don't know what it was I was trying to achieve, but it just, just had too much energy. I think. Mm. And, uh, and to some extent, it was probably wanting to get out. You know, wanted to get out of Peoria. Wanted to get out of, uh, you know, having to. I, I mean, look, I, I took care of my brother a lot uh, when I was younger, and my mother admitted to me several times that she had me take care of him more than she should have. And um, uh, and you know, she died at a very young age. My father died at a very young age. Uh, but um, but I was out of there before they died. And um, you know I just I think part of it is I just wanted a little time to to uh, uh, be independent. So whatever tools I needed, whatever credentials I needed to be independent, I wanted those as quickly as I could get them. And it definitely didn't serve me well from an academic standpoint. <laughs> Uh, but you know, you get into the workforce fast, and then and then at that, you know, and then that that sort of gives you time to, uh, uh, to the extent that the workforce is uh, something that shapes the rest of your life, it gives you some time to figure out what you want to do there. Well, and I think it kind of speaks to too that sometimes when kids are more intellectually advanced and you know they end up jumping grades or going to college when they're fifteen or something like that, that that it also can kind of pressure them into that adulthood world before they're really ready for that. And so is that something that you've done? You're, you're shaking your head. So I'm assuming yeah, you definitely yeah. felt that way. It's, I mean, um, if you're in a family that has a, a person of, as they say, special needs, um, you, and, and if you have a, a, um, a parent who has a, a, a problem, like a drinking problem, you, you're a little adult. I used to do a lot of panel uh, presentations with other siblings of autistic people. And I remember looking at one of the panels. I was the oldest person in this panel. There was a girl who was maybe, I don't know, 16 if, at the most, and a kid who was maybe 11. And I, I remember saying to the audience, just, I mean, will you look at the three of us? Will you just look at us? I mean, we're, we're like freakishly adult-like. Uh, and that's good in a way, but it's also not great in uh, in another way. So um, that absolutely, uh, absolutely happens. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, your relationship with your mother and some of the things that you write about in the book? It, it definitely seems as though 
she, you know, so she was an artist and I, I found it really heartbreaking when you wrote about the uh, her Phi Beta Kappa key pin that she had given you and that it seemed like her most prized possession. And uh, it just felt so like, gosh, here's a woman who's this artist who is, you know, frustrated about where she is in her life and she wants to create, but she also is kind of burdened by these things. So do you think that that was, um, you know, that those things were an element in, you know, the alcohol and the sleeping pills and things that. You know, she had, um, she had a father who was a brilliant, brilliant man, a, 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 a an anthropologist who uh, taught at Yale and American Indian anthropologist. Mm. And later went on to make a living as an expert witness in Indian land claim cases. And so mm. he was instrumental in winning back uh, land to American Indians to, uh, in, in, uh, to an extensive degree. Um, her mother, uh, on the other hand, was uh, who became later in life my very best friend, mm. um, but she was a very different kind of person. She was uh, you know, a little bit secretive. Uh, she sort of was a uh, treated my mom as her buddy instead of her child. And, um, uh, and, and so mom had this, this sort of very intellectual and look, my grandfather was a snob. I mean, there's no <laughs> other way of saying it. He was a super snob <laughs> and he came from humble, a humble background and didn't ever want to talk about it. So he was like a snob as a way of, I think, erasing his background. And so my mom had this, artistic streak not even streak which i mean she was she was she was it's hard to overestimate or overstate how uh, great of a painter she was mm. um but at the same time she had this sense of propriety you know, this is the way we behave because this is the way my father would have us behave and um and and you know this is appropriate behavior we don't want inappropriate behavior and think about that that clash between the expressiveness of being an artist in the 1950s and the 1960s and the culture change that was going on, especially in the art community in the 50s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the same time, having this sense of, oh, wait a minute, I need to be controlled. Everybody else needs to be controlled. And how do you control a little kid who's off the rails all the time? And so she just had a very, very tough go of it and, and never was able to work through those things. And so what I record in the book, unfortunately, in a way, has to be is just from the perspective of a kid who's seeing things that just don't make sense, that seem harsh toward him, toward me, mm -hmm. um, and seem constantly unpredictable and threatening, like something awful is going to happen any moment and here's a sign of something awful and here's something actually awful but then the next morning it seems to not be spoken of and um and so that was the that was the experience and uh, the, the burden that my mother carried with her and i it's sad that she died at 50 and never really found a way through that and a way to you know just sort of breathe for a little bit. But um, mm -hmm. you know, Steve came to went to live with me shortly before she died because she knew she just couldn't um, physically take him anymore. She was uh, she was too sick. Wow. Well and, and you definitely I think the things that you described just there, I think you do, you know, a, a really good job of capturing in the book when you give examples like um, you know, your mother and father um you know, uh, talking about uh, the pronunciation of, you know, she's pronouncing the town <laughs> Dubois and saying it's French, it's Dubois. That's that right. is the proper pronunciation. And your father is saying it's Dubois, like Du Bois. Yeah. People say Du Bois here. That's how it is. And, and yeah, he's saying, I should... think these people from here can decide how it's pronounced. Exactly. And, and I was like, no, no, the French pronunciation is the proper pronunciation. But you know, we all carry this stuff around. So, I, you know, in hindsight, I look at my mom and I think that wasn't mom talking, it was her, her father talking. And yeah. you know, 50 is young. She hadn't figured out how to sort of compartmentalize that stuff yet. And uh, yeah, so, so uh, 
uh, but again, for for a kid, that's uh, you know, that that's the kind of thing you witness. And um, and again, I didn't want to to look at it from a distance and say, oh, you know, I understand what was going on, but just have the, the, the sort of the relentless uncertainty. What a what a friend of mine used to call the perpetual present mm -hmm. uh, uh, experience. Well, we do have a question um, from Wondra Chang, who was a past guest on Author Talks. She says, not having read the book, how is Steve doing? Ah, thank you for asking. Um, Steve is, uh, in, in by one measure, doing very, very well. So Steve is now um, 59, just turned 59, and he lives in a group home in North Carolina. Uh, mm. He has in the, he's been uh, living there for quite a number of years. He works cleaning houses. He has an active social life. He um, has uh, lots of friends. Um, but the last uh, two years of COVID have been just dreadful. So he calls me now on average three or four times a day, worried that all of the things that he used to do, he will never be able to do again. So he teases, he, and they're obviously being very cautious in a group home setting. Uh, so there's just a lot he can't do anymore. And his anxieties just mount, and he is at the point where every everything that if the internet goes out, it'll never come back on again, and he oh. needs to move in with me. No, oh. uh, oh, but God. they're having it, 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 it's it's you know if a manager of a group home quits and needs to be replaced, then all the managers are leaving, and he needs to come live with me. Um, and it, it just. It, it, it's just been brutal for these past two years. I visited him just a, a few weeks ago and the visit wasn't that great because he had such a long list of things he wanted us to do, but then one day it rained. And so one of the main things that we need to do, which had to be outdoors, we couldn't do. And, or, or, and then as soon as we got home, he, like, he called me and he said, oh, I feel so bad. We didn't see City Hall in Charlotte. That we'd gone to Charlotte, and that was one thing he wanted to see in Charlotte, and he had forgotten to mention that. And to him, that was a major thing. So, having his routine and his lists not be uh, checked has been just, just brutal. But in terms that he is, he he's in a great environment. Uh, there's a state-wide agency in North Carolina dedicated to autism. That may be true in other states, but when we moved there, uh, California and North Carolina were the only ones I could find. A wonderful group home network great education, job training. I mean, it was, it was, oh, going from having to battle for every little thing to going someplace where everything was set up and waiting for us was just remarkable. Wow. That's, that's great. And I, but I can see exactly what you're saying about all of the uncertainty that everyone has had over the past couple of years. But then as you know, especially for someone with special needs who is going to be very focused on, again, things that, you know, if it doesn't work, then gosh, it might never work again. And again. so I'm sorry you've had all that stress. I'm sure that, no, and he's had all that stress. Yeah, exactly. Sure that's yeah. been really, he's, he's really struggling. challenging. Uh, and, and trying to reassure someone over the phone, you know, multiple times a day. I, I know that my, I have a 97 year old grandmother who is in, um, in care as well. And, and I know that sometimes she also needs, you know, reassurance or she's letting my parents know, you know, things that aren't going well. And, and it can be really challenging as a, as a family member and a, and a caregiver to try to try to give that reassurance, you know, over the phone or say, hey, you know, ask the people there who are supposed to be taking That's care of you if they can, right. you know, get you these things. But I, I know that they often face that too, so. It's true. Well, Steve, Steve now has a cell phone, which is uh, sort of given him a list of people he can call all day long to <laughs> express his displeasure with one thing or another. The challenges he gave, Steve gave my phone number to another guy with autism who lives in his, uh, uh, community, not in his group home, uh, who now also calls me very often. <laughs> and so <laughs> just one, one is actually fine. So, so what would you say are your, your hopes and your, your goals as far, as far as the book uh, goes? What are you, what are you hoping that readers take away? And, and do you have certain things that you hope it achieves? 
Oh, I have to say I have not thought about that. I, I haven't, and probably I should. Um, <laughs> I know I don't think enough about readers. I just think about the experience I'm trying to record, and, and I just I have this feeling that the more precisely you record the specific, the more universal it is. And so I, I hope that people look at this and say, I didn't have this experience of extreme embarrassment in trying to buy a shirt at a department store, but I certainly have had weird things like that happen to me. And so, so I like that. Um, it, it's it, one of the, the things that I do hope uh, as I think about it now, uh, I think we all go through life thinking we're the only one who has done X or who has felt Y. Um, and um, I think that uh, to know that you know, most of us have all those same feelings and to just see it expressed publicly, I hope has a, a, a bit of, a, uh, uh, of an easing effect on people. As for the book, you know, I hope it sells modestly. The publisher uh, who took the book, and, and I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm just going to brag now. Yeah. Um, I sent this manuscript, didn't send it, I sent it to just to two publishers, and both of them were interested. And before the one was able to decide, the other took it. So I was sort of shocked that it was, the publishing yeah. process was so easy. But the publisher said, yeah, you know, this is going to be a hard sell, but we're going to take it anyway. <laughs> but all right, so it's going to be a hard sell. And I think because wow. it's, it's written in a little bit of an idiosyncratic format and it's not a thriller or or you know, it doesn't have some of the obvious hooks uh, that, uh, I mean, there's nothing I like better than reading a plot-driven mystery. I'll tell you, that's that's my <laughs> thing. And it certainly isn't that, but, but it's got some elements that I hope drive you through it. So I don't know how well it'll sell. But I hope it gets into a few hands. And in particular, it would be personally satisfying to me if some siblings of people with autism specifically were to see the book. That would make me feel good. Uh, and, and I hope would, would do them a little bit of good too. Well, my, my next question was gonna be your path to publication. So you just yeah. dovetailed perfectly right yeah. into that. So so did, yeah. did you get did you have an agent pitching this or were you pitching yeah. it? Okay. You know, like I said, I just, I, you know, look, I, I mean, I've been, I, I had been in publishing for quite a while uh, as a younger person, stopped for a long time. I had also been part of publishing professionally, uh, publishing works of others. Ugh. I mean, I, I, I think I might have sent it to an agent. That's just, a big like, sigh. Let's talk about that. <laughs> it's just what a mess. What a problem. Everything is so hard. Why do we make everything so hard? Why is everything so hard? I mean, so I just said, look, can I just, just send the book to somebody and they could just say, it's not that long. Just like look at it. Are you interested? Fine. If you're not fine. Can I please just work with a medium sized or a small publisher who just says, you know, yeah, this is a good book. And we kind of, we have the basic, uh, we, we know the publishing process and, 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 um, you know, and I go online now and I see, especially on Instagram, I see, you know, these, these gesticulating authors, uh, doing Instagram reels about their, uh, their writer's block and, you know, and their, 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 uh, I don't even know what as a way to try to sell their book and get attention for their book. And it all seems so hard. Uh, so I just, I, I, maybe I'm just lazier, but mostly it's just, no. I just don't feel like I have the energy for that anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, going to be 62 in a, another year, you know, let's just, I'll send it out. If somebody wants it. Great. And if they don't want it, that's fine too. But I do find that the publishing world today is, is in, in terms of uh, uh, periodical publishing is fantastic. I mean, I, I mean, who knew there would be so many interesting, energetic, fun. I mean, you know, fun? No. Literature. <laughs> We're doing literature. We don't want to have any fun. But now to actually to be able to write a silly essay about, you know, Ringo Starr or Harrison Ford and send it someplace and they go, oh, yeah, this is funny. We'll publish it. I mean, that's just great. So somebody <laughs> has figured out, not just me, of course, that you know, let's just streamline this process. Let's have a little fun while we're doing it. Let's get things out as best we can. And let's think of it as a process, not as 
this work is the final work that will ever be published and it should be <laughs> perfect. Um, I mean, as I was reading this to you, I thought, oh my God, I don't want that comma there. How did that comma get there? And, <laughs> you know, so I, you just have to, you have to stop that. At, this, at least I feel like you have to stop that at a certain point. So that's my, that's, that's the, the uh, explanation of the sigh. <laughs> Well, what, what gave you the impetus to just go ahead and say, I'm just going to pitch this to some publishers? Were, was it publishers that you knew were open to non-agented submissions? Or or did you just take a shot and go, eh, we'll just see what happens? I, I probably, I was just sort of learning how publishing works in, in this era at that point, because I hadn't been doing much for so long. I mean, I was in the typewriter, send it, the copy out, and you can maybe send it two or three times until... And then they return it to you until the edges are a little worn. They have to type up a fresh copy of it. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, I think I went to Submittable and just looked for the who was looking for work. Mm. And these two sounded uh, like pretty decent presses. Leita Books, the, the publisher, they're really sharp outfit. They they're operating mm. out of Spokane. They want to work with people who are not uh, sort of in with the in crowd. Um, mm. And and so they and they do some really oddball interesting memoirs but they also do some some thrillers and some mysteries uh, and and the people there are just wonderful they're not trying to make a fortune but they are trying to make a buck which i absolutely respect mm. uh, and uh, it's it's just been a joy so i just uh, you know maybe it's just pure dumb luck that i found them and sent it and they saw it plus i have to admit i sent them a first draft mm. i mean when i finished this like i don't want i i didn't write it I mean, I, I took care as I was writing it, mm -hmm. but it was a first draft and I just didn't mm. want to look at it again. I'm like, just oh, this was <laughs> painful enough to write. I'm just going to send it to somebody. And they were very kind to see that, especially the last sort of third of it needed a lot of work. And they were very nice to see the possibilities and to come back with some yeah. super sharp developmental notes. And, uh, and, and then we put it out. So yeah. it, I mean, that worked wonderfully. And look, there are, the more I look around, the more I see these really cool, but pretty darn professional small presses doing some exciting, fun, energetic, imperfect work. Mm. That's that's great to hear. Would if that hadn't have happened for you, would you have pursued self-publishing? No. No. Okay. No. Just okay. again, it's just energy, and just just okay. like I, I would have rather have spent the time writing. Sure. No. Sure. Okay, that makes sense. That and it would have sense. served its purpose. The book would have served its purpose for me personally, uh, even if it hadn't been published. We had one other question from uh, Wondra Chang. Um, so she says, you know, you were pseudo mature as a child. Do you think about what you missed out on and have you resolved that? Is that what your well, memoir is about? I used to think about it all the time, all the, all the, all the, all the time. And there's bits and pieces of it in the book. And uh, if any of my friends from grade school ever see this, do see this, uh, they'll certainly uh, kind of know what, what this is all about. Uh, I was in a, a so-called gifted program for some of my elementary schools. Elementary school for us was, uh, you know, whatever, one through eight. Mm -hmm. And so this was maybe sixth, seventh and eighth grade. And uh, I think all of us felt like we were uh, segregated from the quote unquote real world. And I, I was haunted by what I felt I'd missed out on. I mean, I still feel that way. Like, I, you know, people seem to speak a language I don't understand. There's a part of the book where I'm trying to figure out what the, the verb uh, that started to be used at that point to party, I'm trying to figure <laughs> out well, what does that mean? Like, how do you do that? What do you do? Uh, how does that work? Relate and to that. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I, I now figure it out that there are a few other people who feel that way. There's a scene in graduate school oh, yeah. of a party of all these people who sort of barely knew each other. It's like, what, what, what are you doing? How do you, what, you're dancing. Why are you dancing? How can you be dancing? You don't know each other. How does this work again? And um, so, yeah, it was, it, that was a, that was a, brutal experience and as anybody who sort of grew up and were too mature or too young uh it's 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 my not, hands it's, raised yeah it's, it's it's a weird feeling but you know I, I just tried to circle around and do some of those things in my 40s and 50s and 60s and that's have, have a little bit of a extended you know adolescence or <laughs> exploration yeah. of that later on well i still listen to the music i listened to when i was 
15 years old. So 13 years old. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm what, I, what is that for you? Uh, well, listen, 1973, what did we have? We had great albums by the raspberries. We had great albums by, uh, bad fingers, Slade, Susie Quattro, uh, New York dolls. How can I not mention the New York dolls? I mean, these, these were the, the sort of the, the, uh, you know, pop with a little, guitar sound to a glam rock, uh, Alice Cooper, um, uh, pivoting into punk music, like with the New York Dolls, that's, yeah. that's it. And, and, and not all of the, are, uh, the ones I listen to are quote unquote, you know, good records. So Elton John, don't shoot me, I'm only the piano player. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, there's a time when I would have turned my nose up at that, but boy, my friend Dina turned me on to that. And I still listen to it to this day. Mm. So uh, no need to grow up for me in that standpoint, from that standpoint. Yeah. Well, what are you working on now? What's, what are you writing now? What's going on with that? Uh, I am writing mostly essays that to, I'm not sure anybody, I'm not sure they're, they're perceived this way, but to me, they're, they're parodies. They're, mm. um, so I, I typically sort of pick, have a voice speaking, uh, 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 usually a voice that uh, that is overly focused on something that seems to have no particular importance at all and and just delves into it incredibly deeply. So I was I was very fortunate to have the Los Angeles Review of Books uh, publish an essay of mine that was about the use of commas in the work of a incredibly obscure pulp author named Basil Heater. And the example through most of the essay was, a novella published in Manhunt magazine in 19, well, I don't know, you know, 57 or something. And, and, um, and, and, and so I sort of create these extreme personalities having extreme reactions to things like that. They're also my reactions, but, <laughs> you know, I build a little bit of distance there for comic effect. I mean, I wrote an essay about uh, the Ringo Starr's uh, album Ringo. Uh, it's called Ringo in the Time of COVID. I was very proud of that, and mm. that was about, um, but it, it ends up uh, explaining why that record was so necessary in the time of COVID, but then like there's this, this scene of total outrage over the last song and that, and that it seems sort of dismissive and Ringo is leaving us behind, but just silly things like that. <laughs> um, and, and then I'm also writing a series of essays about uh, autism and the creative process uh, that I'm really, really pleased with, enjoying quite a lot. Uh, and so I have one essay that uh, about repetition, which is obviously important to autism, but also is important to uh, writers mm -hmm. and uh, uh, selection of, of uh, material um, and uh, one about um, description and what uh, we can learn about description from people with autism, at least mm -hmm. actually not from people with autism. All of these are about my brother because I can't speak for other right. people with autism. Oh, sure. and, uh, and those have been a lot of fun. That's at a place called the Dilly Dune, and I don't speak old English, so I don't know how to pronounce that. Dilly mm -hmm. Dune Review. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we'd probably pop a, uh, yeah. a link up there at some point. But those those have been fun. And I've been getting really, really positive reactions to those. Do you, do you find that people are, that that's helping to educate people about how, you know, creativity and autism and, and some of those things kind of work together and... I don't know. And again, at I, least from your personal experience of I, having a problem. You know, it might. Um, I'll tell you that the, the, the level of knowledge and awareness about autism now is so far beyond what I ever could have imagined or my family could have imagined in the, uh, my brother was born in 62 and in the years after that, nobody knew what autism was, the, the, the professionals seemed barely aware of what autism was. He wasn't diagnosed mm -hmm. until he was eight years old. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and and it was, people, if you said autistic, people thought you were saying artistic, which, you know, is fine, I get it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and now, you know, we understand the, the spectrum of autism. We understand uh, that, that um, you know, the different kinds of support that people in different uh, areas of the spectrum uh, require. Uh, and, and also there's a, so much greater appreciation of um, what um, uh, 
the, the different elements of the, to shift metaphors now, the constellation of autism, you know, the different sort of pictures those create and the different pictures those create for the people who, who have autism. And mm -hmm. so I, I think there's a, uh, certainly a better awareness. Where I'm really focusing is uh, specifically on the area of the creative process and, uh, and, and trying to understand by looking really, really closely. These are short essays, but, but I, I, they're, they're, I think they're a little, probably a little intense. Um, uh, about the creative process and uh, and what at least I can learn from um, uh, from my brother about uh, the creative process in a way that's both liberating and also recognizes the the the, the, the extreme discomfort that comes with creativity and uh, and and I assume for my brother comes with uh, autism and having to deal with a world that uh, often just doesn't really understand it doesn't make any sense to him and that is something that i imagine we all feel it's these sure. days in particular right so what what suggestions do you have for other aspiring mm -hmm. authors and and writers out there mm -hmm. as far as you know kind of either you know on the creative side or, you know, the publishing side, do you have any suggestions based on your experience? Well, I feel I, like I mean, I, a whole I don't, other interview. I really do. What's that? <laughs> I said, I feel like this, like asking you about writing and publishing, just looking at the reaction on your face yeah. when I asked that, I feel like this could be a whole other interview. Like, do you yeah. want to be here another hour and a half? I, we could do this. Well, and this is great fun. I'll tell you, it is great fun. And, and, um, um, I, I don't want to put myself in a, I don't want to be pedantic. I don't want to give too much advice. I, I can only say what, what kind of I've discovered. And the, the thing I've discovered is that there's really no substitute for occupying the moment when you're writing. And that that's a, uh, that's an experience that, that, that sensation that requires a certain amount of rigor. And uh, there are so many times uh, in my writing that I've let myself off easy with a, an image that, just sort of seemed right, but I wasn't looking at it closely enough. I remember when I was really a young writer, really, really young, uh, I had something in a poem about a wet newspaper being blown down the street. And my professor uh, told me something I will never forget. And he just said, actually, would it be blown down the street if it were <laughs> wet? And but no, so I hadn't actually seen that. I hadn't occupied that moment. And so that was that was a great lesson for me, and and that was a test as I was writing this. A, it, and and it goes for in the essays I'm doing, it's the same for thought. I mean, am I thinking hard enough? Am I letting myself off the hook uh, too easily? Uh, am I doing something that sort of sounds right? Or I mean, this is the the other part of that is am I am I um, uh, um, to being conveniently forgetting something? that I should be remembering? Um, or am I presenting myself to the world in a way I want the world to see me as opposed to, uh, or my thoughts in a way that will make me seem super smart rather than mm -hmm. just saying, well, wait a minute, what am I actually thinking? Let's focus on what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. And I think writers, this, this is actually a part where the internet scares me a little bit. Mm -hmm. If we're thinking too much about our, our online um, persona and uh, you know, what everybody thinks of us online, then um, that that's a little scary when it comes to writing. However, the thing that's fantastic when I'm on Twitter and looking at all the reading all the writers tweeting is the level of honesty and mm -hmm. the level of willingness to just put out those random thoughts that are the most interesting thoughts and the most important <laughs> thoughts is is fantastic and so uh you know i think that i think that you know without any advice from me it seems like the world is the writing world is going in the right direction and as far as publishing goes you know just I always thought the same thing about publishing let it occupy a portion of your mind not a lot of your mind and um and and don't and write for yourself and and uh you never know what somebody's going to take. It'll always surprise you, and uh, you know, just just uh, it, it's not that you shouldn't pay attention to what the publications might want, but you know, just.
think about it when it's time to send things out. Don't think about it while you're writing. And that's much easier said than done. Well, I appreciate that you're sharing that because I, I think I've been reading so much advice sometimes that seems to say the opposite of more like you have to know your target market before you even start writing. You need to have a sellable book. Like you need to, you know, almost like, you know, reach out to your audience and find out what they're looking for before you even write. And I, and I, while I respect that advice on one hand, I also think that from a writing perspective and from a more of a purely creative perspective, that is the most intimidating thing in the world. Like, I have no idea what, you know, like, yes, I, you know, you could skew to a certain demographic, maybe like, oh, I know this book maybe might speak more to women and it might speak right. more to women right. from the ages of 25 to 55 or something. But I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge range. And so I, that's just something that I personally find really intimidating. And so I appreciate that your advice is more like, and I think it shows in your book, hmm. hone in, focus on your experience and, and what it is that you're trying to share. And that if you don't do that first, you're not going to ultimately have that creative product. Yeah. I, I mean, I, th I think that's true. What you're describing doesn't sound like any fun to me. That's that's the main thing. It's just you know we we have a limited number of minutes, hours, months, years on this planet. Um, you know, I, I I would prefer to spend that time having fun <laughs> than doing something that's basically just sort of a project or a, 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 or an intellectual exercise. Although that's actually not an intellectual exercise. It sounds like a marketing exercise to me. Mm -hmm. And um, just none of that sounds like fun. And, and, and I actually reject that advice when it comes to the idea of being popular too. Um, and I, th I'll just give you one example. And this is, um, and, and I'm sure there are hundreds, thousands of these examples. When I lived in New York, there were a whole bunch of bands that were getting a little bit of press. And the one band that everybody said, oh my God, they're just too weird. This is the one that will never be popular. These other ones, they're going to be huge, but this one, not at all. And that was Talking Heads. Mm. Everybody said, oh my God, they were so weird. And, <laughs> and they were the band that by far and away were more popular than any other band there. And, mm. you know, David Byrne, believe me, he wasn't he didn't care what his, he was just doing what he sort of could do and what he gave himself license to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, I used to sit at the same table with him and CBGB when there would be like 20 people in the audience or 30 or something. And he'd just be sitting there drinking light beer and just watching the band and no affect at all. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, no black leather jacket hanging out with all the people, uh, you know, making crazy noises or whatever it is they did. Um, he was just, he was just a guy doing what he could do. And so I think that's a path to popularity, frankly. Mm. It kind of the not being afraid to just be yourself, do your own thing. And, and like you said, and if it resonates with people, it resonates. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And it sounds like that's a big piece of your writing philosophy. I, it it is, but again, I just I really try not to think about others too much. So um, um, I just I just is it is the made thing? Does the made thing seem to be working? That's that's about as far as I take it. The other stuff is just so baffling to me that, that I try not to think about it too much. <laughs> uh, the irony is that in my day job, I I oversee um, uh, corporate communications functions, so. Um, I do actually have to think about that during my daytime job. <laughs> I've worked in corporate communications as well, so I, I relate to that. There you go. But yeah, I shut that off when I, uh, when I start <laughs> writing. Although I did write, I do have a piece coming out soon that's called A Secret History of Acronyms, which is um, a, a, a sort of a sort of fictitious, overblown view of what it's like to be in the room when acronyms are being hatched and developed and when they go wrong. So, uh, so there's, there's, uh, there's even some, some fun in corporate communications. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. There and there's and there's a lot of fodder, I think, that you know, for funny stories and yep. you know things like that. And <laughs> for sure. So, I, I guess I just I see another comment, so I just kind of want to tap into that sure. just just a little bit more. I know we've you know I know this has been one oh, of my yeah. longest interviews, I think, but <laughs> we've had a lot to cover, and there's been a lot of good things. So. Sure. Um, so Wondra just mentions, um, you know, when you have a publisher, you're obligated to make your book a commercial success. Yep. And she's saying, you know, that she thinks about that, you know, when she every time she posts on Facebook. So yep. so I do think that that as a writer, it is, you know, and when you're starting to study all these things and talking about building a platform and, you know, all that stuff, it can be it can be really intimidating. And I think it can also feel a bit like, you know, I, I want to share my work with people and I want to, you know, connect with readers, but I also mm -hmm. don't necessarily want to feel like I have to be out there 24 seven yeah. posting on all the social media channels and, you know, doing videos and things like that. And I, and I know that, like you said, there are writers who do that and, and they seem to enjoy that and that's more their thing. But do you also feel like there's space for writers who maybe are a bit more old fashioned and don't necessarily want to be quite as out there with either their personal lives or recording videos every day or? Um, I, I mean, I hope so. Um, and, and I guess I would maybe answer that in, in, in suggesting there's a third way, um, which is, um, well, first of all, let me just agree that that you want to sell a book. You just mm -hmm. you, you have a book. You you want to sell it. I'm I'm here. I'm trying to sell a book. Uh, I've been working very hard to uh, to sell this book, um, and I also am trying to do it. And it's been a real learning experience, especially working with publicists. Uh, I'm trying to do it in a way that um, is natural and true. To, um, to to me. And so the uh, blinding glimpse of the obvious that I got on Twitter was that the most popular tweet I had was not, uh, buy my book, it has some really cool scenes about New York City in the punk rock era, but was, do people still carry pocket knives? <laughs> and so that was like, I got so much discussion and so much conversation about that. And, and and I was sort of interested. It's like, you know, oh yeah, I was reading this novel that's set in the 40s and like all the men had just carry pocket knives. Do people still do that? And and that that was something that, that got attention. And so mm -hmm. still, I just feel like if, it, it's all a learning process. If I could just direct this towards something that that genuinely I'm 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 interested in and that I think is is you know interesting and or weird and idiosyncratic then okay that's what i'll do um and uh and and the people who seem to use social media effectively to sell their books are uh, seem to do that uh, quite a bit mm -hmm. and um i think all the marketing tools that are available and that you can get support uh to execute to get your book out there that's what you got to do, and uh, and I, I think it's it's definitely worth doing. So I don't want to be snooty about this, but um, uh, and I think uh, a lot of energy is, and a lot of attention and a lot of creativity and a lot of networking is involved for sure. Um, but that um, I I think that can be so fun. We've met each other. I've met some very interesting people. Uh, right. It's been great. Yeah. Well, and I feel like your pocket knife example speaks to the idea of just being real online and yeah. just sharing something that is genuinely yeah. interesting to you. It's a question that you have. And so and so then that opened up like a real dialogue with other people versus the, like you said, more of that feeling that marketing pressure of more like, buy my book or here's my book or look at my book or, or here's what I'm doing. Just being like, hey, you know, what about this? Is this something that you know, you relate to, or is this something that, you know, interests you or, or is this something that people do? And, and so, you know, it seems to kind of speak to that too. Yeah. 
So do you have any other, you know, final thoughts, anything else that you'd like to share? I know we've covered, covered a lot of ground, anything. A lot of ground, but I just thank you for uh, taking the time. This is a a rare opportunity to have a a nice long conversation and, and uh, it's just, it's it's fun to be able to chat. Uh, So thank you very, very much. And uh, I wish you good uh, fortune uh, deserve good fortune in your, your <laughs> interviews, your writing, and of course, your corporate communications work. Oh, <laughs> I, I think corporate communications may be in the past more for me, but I, ah. I so I so appreciate um, your comments. I so appreciate your time today and mm-hmm. coming on and sharing the book with us and, and also just, you know, sharing, I think, those common challenges that writers have with marketing and publishing. And like I said, maybe I'll have you back sometime and we can do a whole other <laughs> discussion. We could even have more multiple people on and, you know, have a little uh, panel or something like that and, and talk a little bit about that because there, there's just so much, I think, you know, breadth and depth to everything with marketing and publishing these days and, and yeah. all of that. So I'm just going to give your book here another plug. So Rob Fromberg, How to Walk with Steve. Um, it comes out on September 7th, but it is available for pre-order on Amazon, um, $9.99 for the Kindle version. So go check it out. It's a really interesting book. You will feel the tension <laughs> as you're reading it. He crafts you know, some really well-written vignettes about what his growing up life was like, um, both with his autistic brother, Steve, um, and his parents, um, who uh, were artistic folks that also had, you know, their own challenges. So thank you again uh, so much, Rob, just for being here. And um, I hope people will check this out and uh, go get your book. And you'll start hearing more from other people and and getting some of that feedback, too. That's so. great. That's great. Jane, thank you so much. I appreciate it more than I can say. You're so welcome. So thanks everyone for watching Author Talks where writers are an open book. Um, We are taking a quick break next week um, as it's Labor Day weekend, Um, but then I will be back on um, September 11th with Ashley Renard um, talking about her memoir, Swing. So thanks again for being with us. Have a great day and take care everybody. Thanks.